Sam. Sam. You near the straw? Oh, yeah. But Koga. Ти газ да живане, јелно твоја радојка. Јас сонем. Види е колептирица. Sometimes I exaggerate just to clarify, make it clear, and not spend too long, you know, describing what I mean. So it's a shorthand, and the danger with shorthand is it's a buzzword, and it has all these associations. Of course, I don't mean he's a cult leader like Jim Jones. I mean he's a cult leader in the way that I felt that I was in danger of becoming a cult leader. Sometimes I exaggerate just to clarify, make it clear, and not spend. Too long, you know, describing what I mean. So it's a shorthand. Sometimes the danger is shorthand. It's a buzzword, and it has all these associations. Of course, I don't mean he's a cold leader like Jim Jones. I mean he's a cold Incoherent long thing about Streber? Yeah, it was kind of a psychoanalysis of his. Oh his my story. God, yeah. I, I mean, you'd have to be crazy to understand it. Mama? I'm not your mama, boy. It's not you, Mama. Your head. Mama, don't hurt me so. Boy, it's you, you're hurting yourself with your dang foolishness. <laughs> I understand some birthday greetings are in order. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, happy birthday. Yeah, well, I, I guess so. Thanks for that. <laughs> Is the uh, information on the Facebook page correct? Uh, you, you've reached the ripe old age of 29? Yes, that's correct. Wow. Yeah, wow. that. Wow. Wow. Yep, so it is. Yeah, the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. Yeah, that's right, but um, probably already past the, the... What's that saying? Better not to begin having begun, better to finish. Always go for the sloppy finish. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, anything less is uh, just cheating everybody concerned. <laughs> Oh, well, how goes it down there? Everything in order? Everything under control? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it's under control, at least not my control, but um, it's coming along. Good. 
And how about over there? Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Uh, so, uh, is it different in uh, Sicily than it is in southern Italy? Have you been down there before? Yeah, I've been here a couple of times. It's it's more beautiful in Sicily. It's the impression you always get crossing over because it's more green. I see. In Calabria, you look outside, it's more brown. I guess it's uh, drier. There's less rainfall, so there's less green. You get to Sicily, it's a little greener. Everything looks a little fresher. I see. You know, apparently um, the bungalow where uh, Aleister Crowley had his uh, infamous... Uh, Abbey of the Lima is still standing in Sicily, and the locals stay away from it because they think it's cursed or haunted or something. Um, <laughs> it might be an interesting uh, place to go. Probably is cursed and haunted. If you're lucky. Yeah, I don't. I don't doubt it. They uh, they tend to be. Well, I I. I suspect it's probably cursed and haunted because they've made it so afterward, you know. Well, I think he certainly did a, he certainly put in a, a sincere effort for making it cursed and haunted himself. You have to give credit where credit is due. Well, that could very well be. Um, but yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, that would be an interesting thing. You could do a recording from there. I could do a recording from the ruins of the secret school. <laughs> <laughs> we can pull a William Henry and try to open up a portal. We could do actually. Actually, we could do it at the same time if we could get an internet connection from both places. Absolutely, we'll do a live satellite link up via CNN, and uh, we'll try to open a portal. Sure, let's just drop some DMT when we get to both places. I'm sure uh, at least we'll be convinced of the fact that there's a portal. Well, that makes me nervous. I, I would rather do the the whole cult leader switcheroo and have my followers subject themselves to the DMT while I, of course, remain the exception. So I'll get, you know, six or eight people, dose them up, but then say, you know, I'm above the need for DMT and just let them roll around, writhe, drooling, that sort of thing. Sure, if we're going to go the way of uh, Aeolus Cephas. You know, apparently after he saw <laughs> the Matrix, uh, he became convinced that uh, he was uh, the one and uh, the, the way he would give people the red pill was by uh, just dose, giving them high doses of salvia divinorum. Now, um, that's a potent sword-acting hallucinogen, you know. Um, uh, I don't know whether that's really advisable, but... Uh, God, there's no, there's no end to stories about this guy. I mean, it's everything you hear is... Well, did you see always the, more. Did you, did you see the documentary that he made about himself? Oh, no. No, don't tell me there's such a thing. No. No, there's a feature-length documentary. <laughs> oh, no. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's about him recovering from his madness. You see, you have to understand that the state he's in now, <laughs> this is his, uh, his, he's reconstituted his sanity. He's pulled himself out of the, out of the depths of, um, megalomaniacal, self-referential insanity. Now, there was a period where he thought that he was the Antichrist. Um, he, uh, he was in jail in New York. Um, and uh, he, while he was in jail, he, he performed this destruction spell because he wanted spirits of destruction to come raging through the city. And after he gets out, um, he, he looks at TV and 9-11 happens. And then... Oh, this, God. <laughs> this, uh, this revelation dawns on him. He was in jail uh, 20 days before 9-11, and 9 plus 11 is 20. Well, that settles it. It's yeah. conclusive. And Solved. <laughs> and so he became utterly convinced that he was himself the Antichrist and the Messiah. All in one. That's right. I mean, if you're going to go for it, go for it all. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And he, he deserves kudos on that because usually if you're going to, uh, if you're going to have like a, a delusion, it's not going to contain such like perfect Hegelian symmetry. You're like, you're not going to, you'll <laughs> either be Jesus or the Antichrist and not both at the same time. <laughs> so, wow. wow. That's 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 impressive, I guess. Yeah, you, I mean, 
There you go. Bullshit. <laughs> Fucking bullshit. I, ugh. <laughs> I can't, I really can't figure him out because it seems like he's like a failed Charles Manson, you know? <laughs> I mean, somebody, you never encounter the minor leagues of complete craziness. So usually somebody with his level of, of madness would have already succeeded in, in having a genuine cult and exerting genuine power over followers in person and abusing them and misleading them instead of these kind of this kind of long extended failed sortie into uh, the world of like uh, you know cult madness I, I don't understand well he had he had an organization running for a little while where um, people were paying him uh, a couple hundred dollars a month for his um, his psychoanalysis uh, his archetypal psychoanalysis or or whatever he was calling it, and uh, their 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 task was to report everything they did in the course of the entire day. You know, going to the bathroom, uh, you know, eating a cookie, um, you know, mowing the lawn, every, so that he could look at it through the lens of his, his um, you know, sort of pseudo astrological um, hermetic claptrap, <laughs> and. Um, you know, uh, that that went on for a little while. So, I mean, you could say that he, he went there. Yeah, but it's it's sort of like um, cult leadership, but in the la but with the, the laziness of the internet age. Yeah, that's the miracle of it, isn't it? Yeah, it's like if it's you want to be a cult leader, but it's 21st century America, and you're too fat and lazy. To actually give it your all, you just do it a little bit by proxy. Like send me money through PayPal. I'll try to oppress you and twist your mind around a little bit, but you know I, I really can't be terribly bothered. But the the rest of it, the pathology is all there. You know I don't mind complete craziness. In fact, I encourage it, but not when it tries to heal itself by way of becoming authority. You know. Like you can read um, Schraber's memoirs and have a grand time. I mean, the guy is telepathically connected to God. God's rays are shining out his own ass. Everything is totally off the wall. That's genuine madness. But Schraber never once tries to set himself up as an authority uh, and, you know, control other people through that authority. And that's the difference between somebody like a Schraber and these cult gurus, or the wannabe ones, like the uh, the Kephas, I mean, you'd be fine if you're crazy, and you just come up with all sorts of crazy shit all the time, but when you try to set yourself up as an authority, and then use that to heal the wound, you know, all, I, when you're desperate for everyone to think that you're not only sane, but extra sane, because you have deep insights into the world, correct insights, therefore you have a special place, you're an authority, that flawed effort to heal your madness uh, it's bullshit I mean just go with it you know yeah well I mean what are you gonna do it occurred to me it might be entertaining if we dragged Kephas onto the show because haven't you wanted to scream at him to his face if we turn it into a debate show if we give it like a format where something goes beep and he has to shut the fuck up and then we'll abide by the same rules and we do these like five minute increments let him do his crazy rant and then we can show him up for the self-contradictory absurdity that he is. It could make well, for Well, it, it's a satisfying idea to contemplate, I can imagine, but the, uh, the reality of it, unfortunately, would be just awfulness. I mean, <laughs> you're, just, you're just exposing yourself to pure awfulness when you do that because, on the one hand, you cannot reason or refute a crazy person. And secondly, the only people who would be interested would be an audience that largely is immune to um, being refuted or reasoned in general. So, well, you see what I mean? I mean, the only people who would be undecided about Kephas are people who are already so stupid that there'd be nothing you could do to demonstrate that he's a loon. Well, 
I mean, we have to ask ourselves whether we'd be trying to produce a rational product or what, or a piece of aesthetic entertainment, because I think that what we're doing straddles the line between the two. So because, I mean, there is no... I was listening to this lecture one time about the early Hegel, and uh, somebody was saying that in the spirit of Christianity and its faith, Hegel was trying to say that we can't have arguments against the skeptic because the skeptic has given in to a rationality and cannot be reasoned with, but we can have arguments against skepticism such that we can fortify ourselves against it. And it might serve a value in that, fortify for people who might want to additionally fortify themselves against madness, although that could be stretching it. I see your point, but personally, I wouldn't be able to bear to even touch it. You know, I, ugh, something about it is so awful that <laughs> to me is unworkable. You know, I just can't even go near it. The, uh, it's just it's such an awful combination what that guy represents because it's the worst intersection between genuine madness and the paranormal. It's like the m most harmful thing you can imagine to happen to the so-called paranormal right now is somebody like Akifus. I think that he's an inevitability to that extent then. Because, um, I mean, if you're going to go out on the edge and you're going to take hardcore drugs and you're going to disappear into the rainforest and you're going to just fill your mind up with, uh, with Castaneda and Streber and McKenna and uh, your only touch with real Western culture will be uh, Jung and Nietzsche, if you want to sum up what this guy is working off of. Now, Jung and, and Nietzsche, without any other context, can be, are, are susceptible of being badly misread. And uh, so this guy, on all of his drugs and with his Aleister Crowley, I mean, he's just has taken this and created this crazy universe, you know, I feel like he's kind of an inevitability of of the worst that the, the subculture can make. Well, I won't comment on its inevitability yet, but I will say that the awfulness that he represents, as I conceive of it, owes to the fact that it's so many-layered. In other words, if he decided to actually go the usual route and become a bona fide cult leader or try to become an Aleister Crowley or, the, you know, these losers who... It's, it, it's always a cult of personality at bottom, right? Yeah. That, that would be one thing. That's a well-trodden path. Uh, he could disappear into his own apotheosis with his followers and, you know, be a ph phenomenon which could be well segregated. The most heinous aspect of it is when you take the crazy person and the skewed influences and so on and so forth. And then that crazy person decides that he's, instead of going the usual route, he's going to become a critic, right? With all of the uh, self-consciousness that that implies. Then you have something which is utterly, impossibly defeating and absurd. Like when you look at his piece, for example, right? The whole second half of that bullshit piece that appeared on Reality Sandwich is him navel-gazing and doing what sounds like very reasonable self-analysis. When you have someone who's actually crazy, who has armed themselves with the, the rhetorical maneuvering of the critic, who can therefore speak about themselves in an apparently very reasonable way, you have something which is such a mess, it's such a densely woven, complicated mess, that you can't do anything about it. But you can't that, do anything with it. Isn't that just the mess of, of, of a person's psyche? I mean, isn't it possible to say that um, there's a little bit of craziness in the average person, and uh, this is he feel might feel more comfortable articulating his psychological instability because he believes it's a kind of gnosis, so he's like sort of nakedly throwing it out, so that he some he's he's displaying a level of contradiction that someone might usually only display to say an analyst. But because 
of this weird Castanadian like Crowleyan idea of transcendence that involves a kind of madness, he's amplifying and displaying um, a level of psychological instability that can coexist with some level of critical self-analysis. No, I don't think so at all. I think the difference is that the self-analysis is not constructive in his case. You can have people who are neurotics, but then you can also have people who are psychotics pretending to be neurotics. In other words, you can have a Woody Allen who comes in, who's constantly going over everything in his mind, and uh, that can be occasionally productive if he arrives at some truth which he incorporates and then moves on to pursuing some other truth or solving some other puzzle. But when you have someone who's just a full-blown psychotic who comes in and pretends to be a neurotic, the armor is totally impenetrable because there's never any truth. It's always pretend. So th when I read the second half of that piece, for example, or, or some of the, listen to some of the podcasts he's been on, what I hear is someone who is actually at bottom mad, but who is now so practiced in imitating neurosis that he can perform like a parrot all of the, you know, the self-analysis and do it, do it convincingly. But the proof is always, what does it, how does it actually function for him? What does it actually produce? And you see all it is is just, it's talk, it's, it's, it's insane. Because when he, when he defends himself against queer criticisms, he never actually acknowledges any of the truth of the criticisms. The truth of the criticisms never touches him. So well, what you're dealing is a per, with a person who's totally removed from reality. And they just, they mouth all of the you know, the self-investigation and all that kind of stuff, there's actually no communicating with him. I wonder. I wonder if it's possible to take a different reading. I want, because, I mean, it could be that the madness is an act. Because I wonder how someone who is really that crazy could even hold it together enough to, to go through the motions of having a book published and, you know, running a podcast. And I mean, if you're really... If you're, if you're that out of touch with reality... I, I mean, is he playing up the neurosis and mimicking that gesture, or is he playing up the psychosis and mimicking that gesture? Is it some mixture of both? Because people who are really psychotic can't function in the world in any capacity. Well, I think that's maybe too broad a way to put it. I well, think there are plenty of people who are like functioning psychotics, high-functioning high psychotics, and I would put him in that category. The people who at bottom have a psychotic hole which cannot be filled or constructed over and that hole ends up shaping the rest of their their lives but and it always shows through I mean look at what we're talking about here we've got a guy who you know puts up these YouTube videos he's clearly out of his fucking mind <laughs> and yet at the same time he presents himself like some sort of thoughtful rational intellectual critic the two exist side by side. And you say, well, how can they actually exist side by side? I don't think that he's an ordinary mediocrity trying to push the envelope and pretend to be insane, you know, because there's some sort of artistic energy or some perception he's creating. No, it seems to me to be the opposite. The real Keefe is, is the one we see when he's singing his songs on YouTube <laughs> with like the, the giant black eyes, these, you know, holes into nothingness and the pretend Kefis is the personality that he presents to himself and he's desperate to present to other people which is a person for whom self-consciousness exists and is real and you know I can I can talk about myself and think and reflect he's actually just nuts I suppose I don't want to get too highfalutin right out the gate but That is very high pollution, I know. My Clint Eastwood man, my perfect. 
perfect dad You were the father I never had I suppose I don't want to get too high for losing right out of the gate, my but surprise at your feet of clay an evolution, a, an evolution of consciousness that seems to be occurring like in the species that is very high polluting I know but what you claim the living truth the sacred flame this, 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 this is complicated because you, you actually write at such a deep level you're such a strong thinker that I, I was a little bit intimidated about this interview you were only doing what you knew to be true Sometimes I exaggerate just to clarify, make it clear, and not spend too long, you know, describing what I mean. So it's a shorthand and danger with shorthand is it's a buzzword, and it has all these associations. Of course, I don't mean he's a cult leader like Jim Jones. I mean he's a cult leader in the way that I felt that I was in danger of becoming a cult leader. So, I know this must sound a little bit wishy-washy, but what I guess I'm trying to do is remain a little bit neutral, because I find that Whitley is an exceptional writer and an exceptional thinker, and I would also consider Jason to be very much in that same boat. Uh, he writes and thinks at a very high level, and it takes a little bit of work for me to keep up with him. And, and I was a little bit nervous about doing this interview with him precisely because of that, and I mentioned that I think more than once in the interview. The UFO being like a crack of light glimpsed from the inside of the womb, so as it were, from the, 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 the vagina, like opening. Something like that, which is sort of what what I commented to you on Facebook, which, to be honest, I was kind of hoping that there was a bit of a carrot that I threw that I was hoping would intrigue you enough to, to, to invite you to an interview, so somewhat conscious there. I mean, in the end, the question I had to ask myself was, why do I have this enduring fascination bordering on obsession with uh, Whitley Strieber? I feel like he's a case study. I feel like um, he, uh, this whole line that I wanted to pursue, looking at the New Age as a rejection of reason, capital R, is part of what informs and shapes the whole movement that he's trying to situate himself in. Because this pseudo-critique of reason, it provides a justification for him to stand up to even the most straightforward criticism and to do a kind of double-think to do this sort of um, bending over on itself evasion of cognitive dissonance that masquerades as a sort of mystical illumination or as a kind of philosophical sophistication, like you're saying. And I think that kind of madness is trying to take hold of the direction of the, of the community of people who take an interest in this stuff. Well, you could be right. Certainly, viewed from one angle, the, uh, the cognitive dissonance of, um, of a Kephas who, on the one hand, is mad, and on the other hand, entertains thoughts of, of being... Uh, you know, an intellectual and a critic, that cognitive dissonance is something that is part and parcel of the New Age movement as a whole. Kephas gives a particular flavor to it, but there is cognitive, cognitive dissonance in the New Age to the extent that you've got so much bullshit sitting right alongside what is very probably authentic experience. But... Um, 
he <laughs> he's certainly a unique case. I mean, there's no there's no question about that. And the the Strieber piece that he wrote is just such an extraordinary example of that. I don't know if you're familiar with this. A guy named Jim Mosley. Have you ever heard of this guy in relation to uh, UFOs? I think I've heard the name come up. What's his deal? He apparently is a guy who's been around for decades, like since the beginning of the 50s or the 60s. And uh, he's produced a newsletter for a number of decades called Saucer Smear, which is kind of a uh, very straightforward but comical newsletter that collects the latest news and uh, developments in the so-called field. But anyway, he has kind of uh, the personality of an iconoclast, and he has a reputation for calling a spade a spade and that sort of thing. So there are people who really like him and flock to him because he represents a kind of authenticity compared to all the craziness, right? Right. I know of him only from having heard him interviewed, and I, I saw a PDF copy of one of his uh, Saucer Smear newsletters at one time. So I wouldn't say that I followed him uh, in any real way. But he did a podcast interview sometime within the past year where he was asked at one time by the host, what did you think of that Kefis piece? Because apparently the host or someone connected with him had sent the piece to Mosley for his views at some point prior and uh, Mosley's quote was something like this he said uh, well you have to be crazy to understand it hmm. in other words what he was getting at pretty obviously he wasn't saying that everything in it was false he wasn't even making any comment about the truth or the falsity of, of particular claims in the piece he was making the broader and maybe even more insightful comment that obviously the mentality of the person producing this piece is off. And you have to be a crazy person to understand it. The way that he put it was not the way that you would think, you know, if, oh, that person's crazy in, in order to d disagree with him. No. He wasn't necessarily saying anything in the piece was false, but he was commenting on the general mentality of whoever it was who wrote it as reflected by the words and the argumentation. And I think that's the, the, the natural reaction of anybody with, with half an intellect who encounters the Kefis piece and starts reading it and you're like, what the fuck is this? What is this guy? Who is this guy? And none of it makes any sense when you add it all up because a lot of it's contradictory even within the piece itself. The first piece, then when you add the expansion, the soul-seeking expansion to it, that's contradictory to the spirit of the first piece. You've got Kephas, who's self-evidently crazy, trying to psychoanalyze Strieber. And it's three-fifths projection, the whole damn piece. Strieber's crazy. Strieber's fragmented. Strieber's had these experiences. And it's the very act of trying to make sense of those experiences, which proves that Strieber's insane. And, you know, you're reading and you're reading and you're reading, and you look at, look at it and you're like, well, obviously Stri uh, Kephas is talking about himself to a large extent. But then you've got all the love-hate stuff, the single white female stuff, where the first half of the piece, the original piece, is Kephas trying to uh, charge Strieber with everything, fault him for everything. Strieber's a cult leader. Strieber sets himself up as a John the Baptist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Strieber is, you know, obsessed with angels and demons. And, uh, of course, when you look at the actual evidence presented, you find that Kephas has so totally skewed and misrepresented Strieber's work that it's absurd. Later, however, when he's called out on that sort of thing, on message boards and during podcast interviews, unlike your normal academic neurotic who will try to counter by twisting the charge back to his favor, Kephas totally refutes the reality of it, denies the reality. No, that's simply not true. <laughs> you know? Like when, uh, in the one section, Angels and Demons, of that original piece, Kephas claims that, okay, he's, he's now saying that Strieber's gone mad. At some point in the past few years, quote-unquote, Strieber's gone mad. 
and proof that he's gone mad is his new preoccupation with presenting the visitors as angels or demons. In other words, previously he had a more ambiguous, more complex view. Now something snapped in Streber, so now he's just oscillating wildly back and forth. Angels, demons, angels, demons, right? This is Kephas's claim. It's as clear as day. Then you look at the evidence that he presents for the claim. He's got a before and an after snippet, right? The before represents the more complex, sane, ambiguous viewpoint. The after represents Streber claiming the visitors are now demons. The problem is, of course, when you look at the source for these two snippets, you discover they both come from the exact same journal entry on the website. So how can you say that there's this distinct historical before period and an after period? You know, like before Picasso's blue period and after the blue, or whatever the hell it is. How can you say there's this distinct before period and after period and the evidence you present for that claim both comes from the exact same piece published in the same day. When that was brought to Kephas' attention, rather than try to reconstruct it and say, no, no, my view is more nuanced, or, oh, here's better evidence, Kephas actually just denies it. He says, no, I never said there was a before and after. So it's how, like, a psychotic would defend himself rather than a neurotic. A psychotic will simply... <laughs> deny it completely. And a neurotic, you know, taken aback by the claim, having been touched by the criticism, will try to somehow change its trajectory and send it back at the source from which it came. Again and again and again, when you look at uh, Kephas and, you know, the way he tried to defend that piece. You have a point. I mean, the same thing has happened to me because I've, I've, I've tried my hand... Um, Comment, with comments and criticisms directed at him. And, uh, I mean, you'll get comments like, well, I never said that, and if I did... He, this is literally quoting verbatim. Uh, at least I'm pretty sure I'm quoting verbatim. I never said that, and if I did, I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane! That's... that's <laughs> well, why did you say it? I mean, can you stand by anything? Is, is the past even real? This is what I'm saying. I mean, some like a neurotic person, a normal neurotic, will have some self-limitation, you know? Even though they might totally be deceiving themselves, they're still suffering under some limitation um, caused by reality. But Akifas, I mean, he can say anything, and you can say anything to him. And it doesn't make any difference. It's like he can just change the reality, like the one in the Matrix, you know? He can just change it so that it was actually totally different than what you think it was, you know? Well, he he thinks that he's it's it's amazing, it's amazing to me. He's completely amazing, um, you know, because uh, 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 he he has this view of reality, where um, everyone, all the human beings who are walking the surface of the earth, are tulpas. They're all um, just <laughs> imaginary, sort of ghosty projections, right? And there's only a handful of real people who happen to be the people who are in the quote-unquote alternate perceptions community, right? The people who are interested in this UFO stuff, in this, in psychedelics, who are interested in the occult, who are interested in conspiracies. They're the only real people on the earth. And that's why they're able to take an interest in this stuff. There's only maybe three or four thousand people in the world. But it's an example of his projection on Streber, because what does he fault Streber for in the new piece? This piece where Streber is brought to another planet after some apocalypse and there's only a chosen few. He, he's, he, he's faulting him for the exact same thing that he's <laughs> writing about. That's what I'm saying. When you're dealing with a psychotic, the contradictions are so glaringly absurd that obviously reasoning with the person's impossible. I mean, every little claim that he made about Streber in that piece was easily refuted. And it's not because he's totally false. If, if you were to rework the argument from the point of view of a sane person, there is some, there's a meaningful thread that could be totally teased out if you were to reconstruct it. But, yeah, I mean, that's just one example. The, the claim that he imputes to Streber where Streber is supposedly... 
uh, the mouthpiece, the John the Baptist. Now, right, this again, if you have any familiarity with Strieber's work over the past 10 years as a whole, immediately you sense that uh, this charge doesn't quite hold up because Strieber has never really in any kind of major way presented himself as singular or unique in the strong sense, right? I mean, he has claimed that his work has a particular role or has a place, but he's never said that his work has a role or place to the exclusion of others' work. That's the, the key trait there, the exclusional part. If you are a cult leader who claims to be Jesus Christ or the Messiah, and you are the most important figure in the world, you're giving yourself that exclusive role and depriving it of others. Now, Strieber has said many times that his work has importance, and he may have even stressed that it has some sort of world historical importance as understood by the visitors, as he calls them, right? But he's never claimed that he's the most important person in the world. And proof of that is obvious. He prints these books called the Communion Letters, right? Where he's presenting presumably hundreds of letters from other people who've had the same or similar experiences. You have, here's a quote from Transformation, right? I found just the other day, which refutes Kephas's claim. Page 144, rather than approach us through the medium of our social institutions, the visitors have chosen to come into contact with us on an individual basis, reaching us soul by soul. Now, Strieber is the first person to kind of put words to the idea, this theory that the visitors have bypassed our institutions have bypassed us at the political level, and now are coming to us individually. You see what I mean? So Strieber democratized the contact concept. Instead of having chosen ones, like in the contactee era, or instead of having UFOs landing on the White House lawn, Strieber was at the forefront of this concept of everyone is potentially going to be visited. You know what I mean? They're coming to us as a whole. So how do you reconcile this democratic vision of contact, which Strieber himself promoted, with the Kephas claim that, oh, Strieber thinks he's some sort of John the Baptist, and it's because he's given himself this historic, exclusive role that he went nuts. Which is even worse when you consider Kephas, of course, is the wannabe cult leader. Kephas is the guy charging people $200 for what, dream analysis or, or you know, analysis of the bathroom habits and all that sort of thing. So, um, but you could, how could you reason with somebody like that? I spent months and months working on a piece to finally refute the expanded 2012 Kephas piece. And... The, the thing that kept holding me up again and again and again is that it was such a disgusting chore. There was no pleasure in it at all. It was just such a disgusting mess because you don't really derive any value or pleasure from refuting a psychotic. It's not like an intellectual satisfaction where, ah, ha, ha, here I am, da, 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 oh, isn't that smarter than what you said? No, it's like, unraveling someone's delusion and having to demonstrate that somebody's crazy. Now that by itself leaves such a bad taste in your mouth because for whom do you have to demonstrate that someone's crazy? Obviously people too stupid to see it themselves. So how on earth are you going to write a piece and put all the energy and time into it simply to, to document the errors of a psychotic person when you don't even get the satisfaction of, of having an audience itself smart enough to benefit, because the smart people obviously take one look at Kephas and know he's a lunatic. Well, I mean, I think, can we say that they're all that stupid, or can we say that he's able to thrive because this is all transpiring on the Internet? Because people, when they read things on the Internet, 
don't give it the same energy and attention that they would if they had to physically go to the library and dig through the Dewey Decimal System and walk upstairs and find a book and, and leaf through the pages and look at the index. I think that to a large extent, everything people, even though there's this inundation of information, people interact with things out of the corner of their eye. They're, they're reading an article, they're listening to an MP3, they're talking to their friend all at once, they read half the article. You know, we live in a generation where uh, we have phrases um, like uh, TMI, too much information, uh, TLDR, uh, you know, t too long, didn't read. Uh, are you kidding me? <laughs> What's the point? Uh, you know, I mean, Jesus Christ. Do you, do you want to just skim over everything, or, or is there any place for rigor? But I think that, I don't think that his whole audience is that stupid. I do think that there's a paucity of commentary. I do see that there's an absence of, of what you might call elders, people who can give a little, lend a little bit of additional perspective. Um, you know, a lot of these people who might go to a blog or podcast like the one that's maintained by CAFIS have some experience with close encounters. Maybe they've taken some, some interesting drugs. Maybe they've dabbled in the occult. Um, and they're sort of on their own. And, um, you know, he presents himself as an authority. And, um, I mean, it's a situation where he's filling a vacuum. And he's and by mimicking the rhetorical gestures of um, a rational person, of uh, of a critic, he's able to just skim by. And I think that the only place where he really sh might show himself up is in this criticism of someone else, because so much of it is talking about a subject matter that's so ambiguous as it is. I mean, he's talking about mystical experiences and occultism and, you know, whatever. And, and you, could, you could mask the fact that you're not thinking in a coherent way if you're talking about stuff that's inherently ambiguous. Yeah, I can see that. I, I would say that if he has a following, it owes to the fact that whenever you have a crazy person who has set himself the task of becoming an intellectual authority, that there is an unmistakable energy and um, vividness isn't quite the word, but people are fooled into thinking there's really something going on. In other words, we, we, let's say you have like a sociopath, right? Sociopath is, is understood to be somebody who, in an extroverted way, is able to act in a completely convincing manner, and yet underneath the core is completely lacking, so that they're capable of doing things, committing acts that normal people are not capable of. So you can never tell a, a sociopath is a sociopath until they demonstrate that there's no line that the line for everyone else, right, that exists for them, it does not. So they cross the line. There's no line. And they're doing all sorts of crazy shit. Akifas, for not being a sociopath, but being more of a psychotic, you could see him as being a kind of intellectual sociopath. In other words, he presents for himself all of these thoughts and this introspection and so on which, of course, he presents as well to his audience. But what's lacking underneath is the same fundamental foundation. And so this shows through when Akifas is capable of having thoughts or saying things which show that at bottom nothing holds together. Like when the quote that you gave, he's like, well, I didn't say that, and even if I did, I meant something totally different. There the line is crossed. Obviously, what we're dealing with at bottom is someone who's a psychotic. However, when you have someone who's engaged in intellectual production as a kind of way to sustain himself, to keep himself going, 
to stay just above totally dropping into the psychotic abyss, there's an extra little bit of energy to it. it there's an extra little bit of sincerity even. A normal person who has a podcast or writes a blog is probably going to have an average intelligence. They might have a passing interest or even a steady interest in these topics, but there's no extra spark. There's no extra emotionality. There's no extra motivation that you sense underneath that maybe would give their thoughts a little artistry. No, you have a plotter, you know, somebody who plods along and, uh, Kephas is not a plotter. He has a desperate psychological incentive to present himself as an intellectual and as an intellectual authority for people. It's his psychotic symptom. So yeah, there's an extra oomph to it. It's that that je ne sais quoi. You know, it's got this little extra something to it that people actually detect. This is what I'm saying. They detect there's something going on with him that's unique that isn't going on with other people. But what they're not smart enough to perceive is that what's going on with him is madness, you know, converted into all of the nuance. Like when, when, when he critiques Strieber, right? He, he critiques Strieber and he calls Strieber a cult leader in the first piece, right? He doesn't say it in so many words. He'll call him a, a John the Baptist and he'll say he has this devoted following who all partake of this strange baptism. Later, in the expanded piece, he comes out and calls him a cult leader, right? And he even defends himself. And he says, well, uh, listeners of this particular podcast where I was interviewed all were upset because I called Strieber a cult leader. But the dictionary says a cult leader in the broadest sense is anyone who has a following. Now, get that. I mean, you're calling someone a cult leader in the context of UFOs and alien abduction, right? That really has a strong meaning and typically can only mean one thing, especially when you're using it to open a piece and you want to cast aspersions on somebody because later on you intend to demonstrate that his sanity no longer rules his personal experience. Now his mind is affected, right? But then later you come back and say, oh, well, you know, technically I was correct because... In the fifth item of this list, of this dictionary entry, a cult leader in the broadest sense is somebody who has followers. There's a level of disingenuousness there that you cannot touch through rational argument. Again, and that's proof that he's totally fucking nuts. And there's, there's no debating with him. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Well, uh, let's, let's see how we can take this. Because some of it could be written off to simple immaturity, too. I mean, because I don't want to even elevate all of it to the level of madness. Because if, as soon as we put it in the domain of madness, then it's beyond criticism. Uh, I would like to keep as much of it on this side of crazy as possible so that it can be subjected to critical scrutiny. Because so, there's so much that passes for, for comment, for punditry uh, in this domain that is really just laughable that, um, you know, I want to shine light on it wherever I can. Why then should anyone listen to you? Assuming that they are listening and assuming that they think that they should, please tell us why. Why should anyone listen to me? Uh, well, I hope I've been answering that really the whole time. Um, well, nobody should. Because 
they recognize themselves in what I say and they recognize it's inspiring to see somebody who's willing and unafraid to be themselves and without putting on airs, without trying to fit, let's say. A lot of people um, seem to think that you're some sort of guru. A guru. Uh, a guru. Is that true? Are you a guru? Is that what you are? A guru? And, and if so, how's that, how's that working out for you? Being a guru. Is it working out for you? Is it? Um, well, guru, you know, in the alternative perception community, you know, which is my audience, my larger audience, um, guru is, is the dirtiest word there is. So you could say that I've played up to that because um, I've always been a rebel by nature, and so for me to put myself, present myself as a guru to a degree. Um, it's a great way to push people's buttons. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to filter out uh, the less discerning, like Rajneesh with his 40 Rolls Royces. I mean, whatever you might think about Rajneesh and whatever the case, the truth is, um, it, it is a good way to yeah. um, push people's buttons and keep away people who aren't willing to see beyond that and, and just admit to themselves that they don't really know, you know what a guru would look like or, 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 or how to trust a person. Um, if they're going to base whether well, you can trust what a person says on external improvements rather than what that person says, well then they're not really paying attention anyway. They're just being triggered and they're just listening to their own patterns. I mean, there is a way. I mean, no, everything I say is really secondary to the way that I say it, or the way that a being that I'm in, th those words come from. And, but that's the point, really, because um, a way of being that is true um, does look a little bit like a guru. I mean, it just has to, because that's why gurus are like that, even if they're fake. They, they imitate and they emulate a way of being that is true, which is, um, what does that mean? Well, I suppose it's paternal. Uh, that would probably be the simplest, the male mother. Um, it's a leader, which is Führer, which is Guru. It's an authority. Um, all of these things push people's buttons because um, we didn't have good relationships with our fathers, we didn't have a good relationship with authority thereafter, so we distrust authority, and we particularly distrust gurus. Well, I don't even know how to go on about this. It's just, it's all crap. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, but it, is it worthwhile to criticize? I mean, when Barclay was a new thing, I'm sure there are people who just thought this isn't even worth engaging with. This is just fucking crazy. You know, but, I mean, there was something there to engage with. There was something there that shaped a lot of the, the course of, of subsequent philosophy, you know. Um, I mean, that, that's what led that guy to, to kicking a rock over and over again and saying, I refute him thus. I mean, everybody's heard that anecdote in connection with Barclay, right? Um, there are some things that have philosophical substance that, you know, you don't want to write off as madness, even if the person is mad. Uh, because it's it represents something real in the zeitgeist, and I think whether or not Kafis is himself crazy, he, he the fact that he's able to get an audience means that the approach he's taking represents something that is informing the community. Well, I think they want some level of intellectual engagement which goes beyond the kind of dreary New Age blog. They want something with some pizzazz, right? And if there's one thing that a crazy person has, it's pizzazz. Now, they don't believe that he's crazy because they don't have the intellectual discernment 
and probably they've ruled out craziness as part of their entrance into the new age, right? They, they've decided, they've made that self-conscious choice. Oh, well, craziness doesn't exist, et cetera, et cetera. But if we're going to talk about anything of value in Kephas, in particular inside his Strieber piece, we can certainly do that. I would lay it out this way. And this is a problem because I think it's, it's an example of intellectual laziness to constantly attempt to see two sides to everything and to find some sort of mitigating circumstance or intellectual value. Well, it'd be like, oh, sure, Kephas is crazy. He's a total psychotic, and everything he says is factually false. But on the other hand, so I don't want to do that. I don't want it to sound like that. So let me try to be precise. I think Kephas is crazy, number one. And number two, everything he says in his piece is factually false. Let's put it like that. The factual basis for almost everything that he says is lacking. And when you examine the evidence he presents, it's obvious. However, if we were to hold up the Kephas piece to a mirror, a, a sort of funhouse mirror that distorts it, that makes it appear to have a slightly different shape, if we were to imagine the piece as it might exist in a slightly parallel universe, obviously there is something similar that could be said about Strieber that would have value. This is most evident when you look at the Kephas piece in its expanded form, the one that appeared in 2012, because there Kephas launches into a discussion of problems with the key. Now, of course, Kephas presents these discoveries as if they're essentially his own, in particular, the fact that Strieber read aloud more than once from the supposedly censored 2001 version and never seemed to bat an eye, you know. Putting that aside, if you hold the view that there's something going on with Strieber that's significant and that Strieber himself has not even begun to answer, and if all of that affects his credibility, the problems with the key are what you should be discussing. The, the inconsistencies and the anecdotes and so on, again, with Strieber, a lot of that can be excused if you stop trying to hold him up to an impossibly high standard of uh, authoritativeness. Anyone who writes a memoir, anyone who tells a story about an event that was truly experienced will tell it differently at different times, stressing different aspects, neglecting others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, given that Strieber has farmed so much of his experience, I mean, there's such a breadth to his experiences, given that there are so many experiences that he has conveyed, and given that he has tried to convey these experiences each multiple times, again and again, revisiting them, revisiting them, either in blog postings or on the radio show, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's bound to be variety in the telling of each of these stories. So, you know, people fault Strieber for that sort of inconsistency, and Kephas, in his first piece, never really gets beyond that level of criticism. For all of the claims about Strieber having a fragmented personality and, and going crazy on account of the pressure he's put himself under by deciding that he's a John the Baptist type leader, all of that's bullshit. The key, however, is a really dramatic inconsistency. We're dealing with something that is off the charts when it comes to its believability and, and its workability. How do you handle this as an intellectual document? How do you try to incorporate it as a, uh, as a document with cultural value into the broader context of human life when there are so many problems and inconsistencies with it? If it were a shoddier document, if it were just a load of crap, you wouldn't even try. But because the first edition in particular is such a, an exemplary piece of literature, at a minimum, that's when all of these other problems <laughs> become fatal. Because if, you, know, you have something which 
is of high quality, it has to have a sound basis in something. When you remove the basis, you can no longer accept it at the same level of, of quality. So there, there is something then in Kephas, his piece, more exactly. There's something in his piece that he only kind of gets to in the second half that maybe is worth discussing in, in connection with Streber. I mean, all that is just deriving from you anyway. I mean, I myself, I, I've read the book dozens of times, but I didn't feel any particular impetus to go and look at the new edition uh, as soon as it came out. The only reason you looked at it was because you were, you were prepping for an interview with Streber. I, I mean, and you had a particular reason to crack the book open again and to acquire a new copy of it. I mean, I doubt that Cephas would have had the, the intellectual acuity to piece out um, the outstanding differences. And moreover, a lot of the interpretations that he... Uh, there's nothing significant there. Because if you take that away, then, then there's nothing there. Uh, I think that there is a value to Cephas in this. He's a perfect example of what I was talking about before as the main problem in the New Age community, which is this pre-trans fallacy, uh, to, to borrow the term from Wilbur. Because it's like it, they've got this psychotic reading of Kant, but there's also this psychotic reading of Heraclitus. The way up is the way down. Madness is enlightenment. You know, if you're breaking down, then you must be breaking through. Because something's happening in my mind. I'm hearing voices now. I didn't hear voices before. I'm seeing things now. I didn't see voices before. I must be making progress. You know? <laughs> and that's, it's literally that. And, and what I'm suggesting is that it, it, he does represent something. He does represent a movement against reason. He does represent a confusion of transcendence with this total insanity, he, he does represent a, 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 a kind of reading from a polluted trough of pseudo-mystical literature and some legitimate things. And to that extent, he's, he's, a, he's an emblematic figure um, in this scene. Well, what bothers me about Kephas and the type of threat that he represents to me is that so you can have a quip of a Terence McKenna, you can have a Terence McKenna in front of an audience talking about self-policing and doing away with idiocy and so on, and then you know there being peals of laughter and all sorts of applause. You could just as easily have a Kephas sitting up there saying the exact same thing. You could have a McKenna sitting up there next to Akifas and perfectly enjoying everything Akifas has to say because Akifas sounds so thoughtful and he's got all of the right qualifications and self-qualifications in, in the right places. And, uh, you know, oh, well, we have to be careful when we set ourselves up as authorities. You know, that, that's, that's Kephas himself defending the criticism of Strieber that Strieber's a cult leader. You have Kephas saying in a perfectly convincing way that, you know, we shouldn't set ourselves up as authorities. This is the same Kephas who is the wannabe cult leader who charges the money for the dream analysis and all that kind of shit. This is what happens when you have a psychotic. So, to me, he represents a unique case. He's a unique kind of threat because if you have, you know, the McKennas and the, uh, the quasi-enlightened figures in the leadership, and then you have the great unwashed, you know, and those two elements go back and forth, that's one thing. But when you have the psychotic wolf coming in dressed as the lamb and, and he's able to say all the right things and even say them better than most people, how, who's there to resist that? I don't think a McKenna would be smart enough. I, I don't think he would catch on that a Kephas is, is raving mad because the, Kef the Kephas in question is saying all the right things. He's saying everything a McKenna wants to hear. A McKenna's intrigued. Oh, he finds that interesting. Oh, that's an interesting twist. Oh, what an intriguing idea. You know? So Akifas is like, uh, it's, it's totally by stealth. He can like invade and infect the whole body of the community. And uh, there's no resistance. 
But on the other hand, he'll he'll go on the podcast and he'll say that he's insane. He'll say that he's gone through periods of insanity. He says that he doesn't know whether he's crazy. He'll go on and he'll admit that he was in a cult and that he's susceptible of being drawn into cults himself. And, uh, you know, I don't know. He, he did shut down this quasi-cult that he was running, uh, presumably because he was getting too attached to it. But, um, uh, that, I mean, that's what he said. I mean, I've I've listened to this because oh, I, I've listened to it a while. I mean, I have no idea what the hell this guy's doing now, but I I used to listen to it because I found it fascinating how someone could be interested in so many of the same things that I am and be so utterly wrong, you know? Because I, <laughs> I could walk along and I could listen to this, and he'll hit a point and a point, and then there's a conclusion that's so ludicrous that it, it, it's baffling and it's it's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating this, the same reason that people turn their neck when they pass a brutal car crash. You know what I mean? It, it, it's fascinating in that sense. And yet, you know, before it become clear that this person is not amenable to any form of criticism, it's like, well, maybe some comment could point out the fundamental inconsistency from which these other inconsistencies are deriving. And maybe um, a little bit of thoughtful criticism and a, a few pointed comments could, um, you know, unravel this. Because here's someone who seems to be making an earnest and consistent effort to, 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 to work, trudge their way through material that presents a lot of its own inherent challenges. Uh, but there's it's disingenuous it's it's on it's it's simple dishonesty on his part with himself uh, and the reason i don't want to elevate it to the level of madness even if madness is present because it because some of it is a simple failure to to face being wrong some of it comes down to um and, and this is what i'll pin it on I've I've read this guy's comments, and he he talks about how he enjoys and engaging with people in dialogue, and he specifically stipulates how he enjoys um, proving his point. He enjoys um, hearing the play of perspectives, but when you read it, it's clear that what's absent from that is that it doesn't say anything about learning from other people. <laughs> He, he enjoy it, it's just a form of conquest. He, he claims to be this kind of advanced spiritual being or that he aspires to be. Or, but if you say that, if you call him out on that, he'll say, no, I'm about deconstructing myself and not being at all. And he'll try to play this, this mystical game. He'll He's always got an answer, yeah. Yeah, he'll, he'll mimic the gestures not only of, of rationality, but he'll mimic the gestures of mysticism. And he does it well enough to fool people on either side of the fence. And maybe it takes individuals such as ourselves who have some rational capacity and who have some acquaintance with mystical literature, um, you know, with close encounter literature, to see as he's jumping from one foot to the other, when he's called out on something rational, he, he, he jumps to the mystical foot. And when he's called out on something mystical, he jumps to the rational foot. Um, might not be as clear cut as that, but he's still jumping from one foot to the other and persistently evading any way that you try to corner him. And my main point being that if you read the reason he says he likes to do this, it ha says nothing about being susceptible to to the possibility that anyone could say something that he could learn from. And that is being outside the the space of reasons. That is frictionless spinning in a void. And that itself, whether or not we invoke all these other pathological factors, is, is already dangerous. Well, it certainly is dangerous. On the one hand, you could read that as simple egotism, as you presented it. Of course, I don't read it that way. I think that what's really going on with him is that at a minimum he has to present for himself this 
staging this scenario of him as a thoughtful intellectual, you know? Of course, the quencher there is just as you say, there's no actual dialogue. There's no, never him learning anything. There's never him even engaging with his enemies. It's just a pure hallucination on his part. He has to constantly hallucinate that he is this sort of self-reflecting, self-conscious, reasoning intellectual. It's all, it's pure ego in the purest sense. It's just a fantasy projection of himself that he has to maintain. And that's why you have such wide, huge, gaping inconsistencies and contradictions where he'll jump from one register to another register in order just to protect himself. It's him fooling people into thinking he's a thoughtful, reflecting individual so that he can better fool himself, so that he can better escape the terrible, churning void of madness. There are dangers, though. There are dangers to that for everyone because people fall for it, of course. I mean, the fact that he is brought onto these podcasts and interviewed and he presents himself as a kind of very thoughtful, he speaks in that psychotic monotone, you know, uh, it's just so, uh, it's this long, flat, psychotic death rattle, you know, that he speaks in. And, uh, and people were just fooled, like, yeah, that's really interesting. You listen to podcasts where the host, like, yeah, I was really intellectually intimidated by you. I have to admit, you know, I, I was nervous bringing you on. And you hear the, the, the suppressed satisfaction in the voice of Akif is just loving it, you know, loving it. <laughs> oh my God, what kind of human train wreck am I witnessing by listening to this? You know, is what you think. Like, how compounded can the absurdities be? And that's another level of danger of the Kephas because you had the old days where you'd have the one dimensional cult leader and the one dimensional followers, and obviously there were, there were absurdities to that, but now it becomes compounded. Now, like the strata in between rational and irrational, sane and insane, they're getting filled out. So you've got all these shades of madness and shades of sanity. I think, to get back to the point you just made, there is something in Kephas that is a kind of figment of humanity. It's kind of like a remainder. There's, there's a tiny something in there which you could recognize as being human. But that actually marks his limitation as an intellect. That is the proof of his mediocrity. You could say that the problem with Kephas is that he's not insane enough. There is a strain in Kephas, this confessional strain, where he goes on and he'll say he's insane, like you mentioned, or he'll say that he's done this, that, and the other thing. And you can detect in that a kind of desire to confess, a desire to reach out and communicate. And it's probably no coincidence that it only occurs when he's really talking about himself at kind of the base level. But how does that operate? How does that function? Doesn't it surreptitiously strengthen the perception that he is somehow exceptionally self-honest? Doesn't that fool people into thinking, oh, this guy is really self-aware, you know, and like the, the Socratic sense, like, oh, he has studied himself and and contemplating himself more than the average person. So it creates that idea. In fact, if he didn't have this confessional bent, if he didn't have this like final resistance, you know, to disappearing into madness, he might actually become more interesting because then he could finally go full blown cult leader, set himself up as like the most important person in the world, absolutely, do the cult thing in the classic sense come up with all the bullshit intellectual discourse production like a, a Crowley or whoever these, these nuts are, and then he would become a more important figure. If anything, the fact that he's not more important shows that he doesn't have the supreme level of insanity or intellect to rise to that level. So instead, he, instead he's a kind of like a second or third rate internet mediocrity and uh, doing damage, and doing stam damage inexplicably by stealth, but limited in his scope nonetheless. Well, Crowley had both. You know, he had first-rate insanity and he had first-rate intelligence. And uh, he was able to get to the top. I mean, it's not easy to be called the wickedest man in the world, uh, you know, on the, the front of a fucking newspaper. 
You know, he was a splendid prosist. He was well read. I mean, he understood his mythology. He understood his world religion. He he seemed to have some decent grasp of philosophy. I mean, he wasn't an idiot, but he was completely stark raving out of his mind. But he, I mean, <laughs> he 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 went all the way with both factors, and he was able to produce some masterpieces of the form in doing it. You know, and. Um, uh, maybe, maybe there's something to what you're saying. He's not crazy enough. He's not smart enough either. Well, maybe we should write a letter to Kefis and saying, listen, buddy, you know, other people take the tack that you're just stark raving mad, but we, we're of the opinion that you're not mad enough, that there's this still fragile remainder of humanity left in you yet to be conquered. And if you would just do that, you could actually produce work that's interesting, you know, that's significant. So we encourage you, go the whole hog finally. Set yourself on fire, plunge into the abyss, and like, you know, produce something of historical consequence instead of just being this sort of slippery, deceptive, you know, uh, minor internet personality with a book, doing thoughtful interviews. I mean, that's a small time shit. Nobody's going to care about that. That's going to disappear in, in no time. Go the whole hog. That's what we need to tell him. Well, I mean, we could always go for it. Well, you write the letter. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, all right. Well, well, <laughs> well look, uh, let's see. Let's, uh, I don't know if I can go on about this. I really don't because it's just, uh, it's just all madness. It's, 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 it's for the very reason that you said that it's impossible to, to finish a piece about it because what is the satisfaction in trashing someone who's insane? I mean, just personally... Um, I, I've I've tried writing on the guy's forum. I've tried writing on his blog post because honestly, I felt some some actual compassion. You know, maybe he's making an effort to to actually break through to these realities. Maybe he's really interested in spirituality. Maybe he's just got some bad influences. And you know, uh, he's, I mean, you it's not even madness. Madness, if it's self conscious, you can go and you can get help. But this is madness combined with this egotistic self-serving uh, thing. This, and that is, is, is beyond anybody's help. It's beyond even engaging with. And I've tried. I've gone on, I've gone on the, the, the blog there and I've made little comments and then the response is so insane that I, I don't comment on it for months at a time or years even. And then I, see, so I go back to it out of morbid fascination, and, and I'm like, well, this, there's something here that's on to something, probably plagiarized, probably lightly lifted out of, you know, some other spiritual text or some other new age thing that's like a third rate pho photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of something philosophical, but, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's on to something, but it's something slightly insane here, so I'll point that out and give some general commentary. The response is still nuts, and uh, uh, the only time, the only time I got him to admit he was wrong about something, uh, is th maybe five or six iterations of going back and forth. I had to be determined to not drop it out of disgust or frustration and just press the point, uh, because he was advocating this reading of the idea of surrender, where surrender just means not doing anything for any reason. And obviously, he, he believes it, because if you look at what he looks like, okay, it means not bathing, it means not cutting your fucking hair. And, but, I mean, I, I carried it out, like, do you take out your garbage? <laughs> you know, do you eat? You know, if you really believe this, then that would have to mean letting your house fill up with fucking trash. It would have to mean just lying on the ground and starving. The, what you're, ad you're advocating something while not advocating it. The reading you're giving to the concept of surrender is so contradictory that the only thing that you could really be advocating is a religion of suicide. But you're not, apparently. So you're just saying nothing, you know? And, um, you know, I went through iterations and iterations of this, and, uh, you know, it's just not worth it. It's <laughs> well, his reading is not even supported in the text, because there's the comment on inaction, the, the, the specific use of the word inaction in connection with Buddhism. Uh, the master of the key supposedly says, you know, there was inaction as if that was a sin. By allowing bad things to happen, you know, you're doing something bad. So he's obviously advocating, at least in principle, for inaction as the meaning of surrender when the text says 
inaction is not what's meant by surrender. Right. So it's not even a good reading of the book. Well, you know, there's one thing he did say that was kind of interesting, and I'll give credit where credit's due. Um, he he, at some point in his one of his books, he said that the UF, the alien abduction scenario, as commonly reported, has a lot in common with. Um, the birthing process because you're you're pulled out. You're yeah, out. I heard that on the podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't even I didn't listen to the whole podcast. He talked about it in any case. Well, that was maybe the one good idea because if you if you couple that I don't know if he couples it up with it because I only skimmed his book but uh, if you couple that up with like the Stanislav Grof and like um, the school of psychoanalysis that believes in like doing a birth regression thing, I don't know if there's anything to that, I don't know if that's a cogent way to pursue therapy or not, but still, I mean, it's a reading that you could take It's if you wanted to, it's it's not a, it's, it's, that's a clever idea, sort of, um, but even, there's not much there that's original, the best that's in him is taken from other people, you've got to watch the documentary though, I mean, if you really... Oh. Be disgusted. <laughs> oh no! I wouldn't be able to take it. I, two minutes, I'd be, I'd be dead. I wouldn't be able to take it. Oh, it's just such a, it's such a spectacle of human. What a fault. fucking narcissist! You make your, <laughs> I mean, you time your documentary on emerging from madness to coincide with the emergence from madness. You know, like you've, you've scheduled it in advance. No, well, he took all this video of when he thought he was the Messiah. And he compiled it after he thought he was past it. And he says that he was bracketing it. He says that he was, I don't know, he, he didn't use the word bracketing, I'm sure. I'm sure he has no fuck idea who, who Searle is or anything like that or what bracketing even means. But he was bracketing the idea of whether he he was the one. You know, he was... <laughs> <laughs> No, it's like I have a I have a megalomania, but I'm <laughs> ironic about it. You know, I keep it in quotes. You know, I don't take it too seriously. But by the way, I am the one. So, what the fuck? <laughs> but uh, you know what? I, I think you could take some this somewhere because this is why I think that he's an example that could be used. <laughs> because no, seriously, McKenna had this thing about being the one. In a way, uh, Crowley definitely did. Pinchbeck did. I mean, his book. Uh, I have. I've got to have a PDF here. Uh, I don't know if I do on this computer. But it, at, at, Pinchbeck has this channeled thing at the end of his book, where where he's talking. He, Quetzalcoatl, you know, the Mayan deity is talking through him, and it's like the the be, being writing this is the vehicle of my arrival. Mark the day of his birth for it is. He was born in like some date that he works out to be six six six, and he's like, and it says the beast prophesied is the pheasant serpent Quetzalcoatl. So Pinchbeck has it. Strieber, I mean, in the kind of sideways way, has it. He makes these oblique references to being, having unique significance, and I mean, there's that episode in Communion where they're like, you're the one, but it's instantly sort of deflated because they're saying it to other people who are present, and you know. But I feel like this kind of mystical experience seems to bring with it, it this this the one thing it co-occurs with this form of 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 mysticism i don't know what you would call it um this kind of otherworldly occult sort of thing because there there's things in common between the close encounter as described by Strieber and the sorts of experiences that were being reported by Crowley and, you know, and McKenna has straight up like UFO stuff in his, his, uh, story about his major turning point in the Amazon. And, and then you find it in more minor figures like Pinchbeck and, uh, and Cephas. So, um, why is it that they become convinced of their being the, one, the thing. Um, you know, why does that motif recur? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot that I want to say <laughs> uh, in answer to that. 
the the McKenna clip where McKenna is uh, sitting there in front of the audience yuck yucking it up, right? Right. Something I thought was notable about that is the way at the end the coup de grace is his joke about pro bono alien proctologists coming to visit. Yeah. Where in a single stroke he is guilty of, of ridiculing basically uh, the ridicule that Strieber complains about and suffers from McKenna is guilty of it because McKenna is willing to feed that red meat to his audience at the end as his big killer joke, right? People will fucking laugh at anything, no matter what kind of audience you're in. If, if, the, if the speaker says it in an absurd enough way, um, people will just start laughing hysterically. They're I'm, rhetorically primed for sure, but my point is what does this reflect about a McKenna? And what it... Ref what it reflects to me is what I suspect listening to the whole thing is that when McKenna talks about self-policing and he talks about calling people out as idiots when they're idiots, what he's really doing is just promoting McKenna. He wants the new age community to be remade in the image of McKenna. And McKenna, of course, by being the iconoclast, by being the, you know, the gadfly, having positioned himself as such, in his mind, in his vanity perceives that he has special value and that therefore the world could only benefit if everyone would become McKenna. I mean, this is the standard fallacy, right? This is the egotism that comes whenever you try to hold a unique place, unique authority. So I think part of this owes to that. I think any time anybody tries to, they, they no matter what, will end up engaging in a level of vanity when they set themselves up, even circumstantially, as being unique. McKenna is obviously smart enough to avoid vanity, but then why this throwaway joke about alien proctologists? Because it could be as simple as the fact that he doesn't believe it because of his own biases. He's so con it might not just be simple egotism, it could just be the fact that of ideology. It could just be his ideology that extraterrestrials would no longer exist on this plane and they'd be more likely to communicate with us via a mushroom, which is actually what he says. If you listen to enough of him, he'll say that the mushroom spores are actually an intelligent species from another planet and, uh, you know, it's somehow channeling this intelligence or whatever. It, it's, it's an ideology. He thinks it's patently absurd that the aliens would have an interest in our genetics. Well, he uh, seems to me to be the type of guy who would actually do it effectively in reverse. He would reject what he views as alien proctology in advance and then shape his ideology around it. Because McKenna is more interested in being McKenna, the iconoclast, and he's obviously willing to believe anything, really, to that end. I mean, you've got these far-out positions that he takes. They kind of demonstrate that he's willing to take just about any kind of position not in the disingenuous way necessarily of Akifas, but you know what I mean. He's got no trouble taking far out positions. So it makes you wonder if at bottom, really all of it is just in the service of a kind of very simple primitive egotism. He's willing to construct an intelligent, thoughtful ideology based on wild, far out ideas, as long as it is consistent with his place as self-styled iconoclast. Buying into the alien proctology thing, even though there's ample evidence for it, would conflict with that because it's too easy an idea for him to ridicule. And obviously, he's the go-to guy for ridiculing idiotic ideas. So, you know, you do the math. Well, that's why he's, he's taken on as a kind of godfather by these people who are rant and rail against the ETH, so-called, because he genuinely believed that the alien experience had to be something inherently ephemeral, inherently ambiguous, inherently multivalent, because his experience of it was that when he was in the jungle, tripping balls, I might add, uh, he saw a flying saucer, and it was a perfect rendition of the Adamski disk and this contactee photo that everybody knows is fake, but there it was, clear as the day, and it went overhead making this ridiculous wee, wee, wee sound, and then disappeared in the clouds. And he, he says that that is, uh, you know, a perfect example of how um, the flying saucers are some kind of externalization of the human psyche, and there's something completely symbolic, and he's taking his experience as primary, 
and he's constructing an ideology around it. Well, I agree. That's the way it appears to me, and I have never studied his work in detail because I've never detected much value coming from it. But you have the simple egotism of somebody who they occupy a place, and therefore really everything they say follows from this place which they seek to maintain. If you're the uh, iconoclast, if you're the wry uncle with your little colorful remarks designed to elicit love and laughter, obviously all of your views are just going to be decided on that basis if they're consistent or not. So you've got that. That's one part of what I would say in response to your question. The other thing that comes to mind is that human experience, that people have said this before, you can, if you like, sign on to the slogan that human experience is always social experience. Another way to put that is that human experience is always compared, even unconsciously, to some notion of what experience in general should be. So when you have someone who has wildly different experiences from the norm, because there is an automatic process going on of comparison, it's very easy to then fall for the fallacy of saying, well, because my experience is so unique, I am therefore unique because I am obviously my experiences. If I'm unique, well, what does that imply? That means I'm unique compared to my fellows, which means I'm deserving of certain uh, recognition. I'm entitled to you know, a certain place or understanding uh, in the community. So th there's a kind of, I wouldn't call it narcissism or even egotism, but something much more fundamental that can take place in people where because they have this automatic, there's an automatic calculation that goes on of them versus their fellows in a way at least after the thing's all said and done, but maybe even during, you know, that they will always end up having this kind of conception of the one, I am the one, somehow I am the one, because they are now set apart from the fellow man. Well, I mean, it's true, and that's why community is a self-regulating thing. And, you know, it's funny a figure like McKenna could be oblivious to it since it's coming out of his own damn mouth. But if you have a, an organized body like uh, the American Psychiatric Association that can disbar people uh, for clinical malpractice, that can hold a certain standard of rigor, you know, and if you pass a threshold, you're out. You know, if there's some open, integrated community with a shared body of competence, uh, they can watch each other's back to some extent. But we're on the wild west frontier with this kind of stuff. And um, the most intelligent figures are just sort of practicing on their own. And uh, they're subject to extreme human folly. Which is why Strieber, it, it, I mean, he does a, a somewhat better job, even even better than McKenna, um, you know, because he's he he is skeptical of himself. He is uh, at other times he he seems really confident of himself, but he is skeptical of himself. He is critical of himself. He does try to take multiple perspectives on his experiences, even if he believes he's important. He he tries to maintain some degree of humility. But all these guys are on this wild west frontier, and they're alone with these bizarre experiences, and they overestimate the significance of what's happening. But community and uh, communal falsification and a collective standard of, of rigor um, and a collective standard of normalcy are, are really the saving grace of everything from science to, to clinical practice. And it's why I, I feel like you know, it's 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 why I, I find some comfort in Buddhism because um, that's a community where mystical experience is something normal. You know, if you're in a monastery and and you have some fucking weird experience, you know, and you come to someone with it, you know, they'll say, well, you know, that can happen if you meditate that way. Um, but it, the point is that it it happens a lot. Uh, no matter how grandiose it is, it's still 
within the context of a tradition where you know you're not the Messiah, even if you have some extremely august level of realization, it's like well that's what's supposed to happen, and it's happened for everybody who's carried through with that. And and the analogy I want to draw is with uh, an entity like the American Psychiatric Association or. Um, the American Philosophical Association. You know, you reach a certain threshold, um, you have a given level of competence, and uh, you're deemed as competent by your peers. Or if you do an experiment, um, you know, your peers will look at it, and if it's off, they'll note it. You'll go back to the laboratory, you'll go back to your desk, whatever the case may be, and there's some sense of normalcy. But there's no standard here with a close encounter thing. There's no, and there's nobody for these people to confer with other than people who either haven't had the experience or who are their intellectual inferiors. There's a lot to be said for a structured community, I agree. And I think if you're talking about Buddhism or even a peer-reviewed group, what you're talking about is community structured around practice or practices. And there's a lot to that. What I'm talking about or what I mentioned before is something that's even more basic, which is the kind of thing you see when, for example, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you've got three aliens standing next to your bed, your very first instinct is to wake up the girl next to you and, you know, do you see this? Look at this, look at this, you know. There's this instantaneous desire to share experience. Another example is when you listen to the uh, interviews with people who for the first time are coming out, quote-unquote, with their alien experiences, right? They have this desire to share, which is really kind of basic and profound. People who are listening to the experiences will always, first and foremost, start asking what intellectually might seem like primitive questions. But really what you're seeing in those cases are kind of like the reverse of what Strieber would call asking from your essence or speaking from your essence. In other words, if even if the question you always get asked is, well, what did the alien look like? You know, people can contemptuously dismiss that kind of question as being intellectually primitive. Oh, that's like the genital sniffing phase for dogs, you know. That's true in one sense, but it's not the whole truth. The other truth is that People are trying to transmit to themselves your experience at the most fundamental level, even though uh, through the illusion of reflection that may seem intellectually primitive, it's proof that humans are social creatures and that there is this kind of ground zero, zero level social bond, a human bond that exists. And at that level of community, well, you, 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 in a way, see the UFO phenomenon taking place in spades because it's the, the community surrounding, you know, the community for UFOs and the paranormal has been deprived of just this kind of structured community that you're talking about because of all the absurdity and the stupidity and the lies. So, you, almost um, ironically, the glimpses you see of community are purer you're getting a purer glimpse of human community in those cases where it occurs. Yeah, but what I'm saying is skewing it is the fact that the experiences are so abnormal and people overestimate their own importance. And, um, I mean, which is bas is what you're saying, too. I, I, I'm not trying to be critical of people who would ask a fundamental and straightforward question like, what did the alien look like? No, I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying that actually you can see like you can see the ground zero level of human community in those instances and for what are, you know take it for what it's worth it's either good or bad or neither or whatever right that's a good point um but um i think that I think you're right. It's a, it's a raw example of, uh, of how a community functions, but I think that it, it goes to show and to reinforce the validity of science, because um, in science, 
you know, there people can say, well, this is what happened, and it can be weighed against the body of literature. It can be rendered plausible or implausible on the basis of some common body of knowledge. But there's no common body of knowledge. There's no shared competence. There are no peers. Um, and not only that, but the people who will listen to you are, you know, at least some of them are there for non-rational reasons. Some of them are there because uh, they're schizophrenics. Some of them are there because they've got nothing better to do. I mean, this is something we talked about in that, you know, uh, uh, some large percentage of the New Age community are there for pre-rational, pre-conventional reasons. Some large percentage of the people who take part in a, in a social or political movement are there for uh, less than august reasons, you know. So, the lack of a standard, the lack of, uh, of critical reception by peers, you know, leaves people vulnerable to their own humanity. And so they have to either watch themselves exceptionally well, as Kafis pretends to do, or as Strieber authentically tries to do, or, you know, they, they wind up floating up into the clouds. What's funny about it is is how these people can be right by accident. In other words, we have McKenna talking about self-policing and needing and the need to get rid of idiocy. He's correct in what he says, but of course he's speaking from the wrong place. He's speaking from the desire for everyone around him to be like McKenna, you know? So his words are correct, but he's wrong. You look at the Kefis example, and he's he's saying, well, something's going on with Streber, and you know it has to do with self-identity, and there are these glaring contradictions, and uh, Streber needs to account for them. Well, again, he's technically right, but of course, we both know in that instance, Kefis is only saying it because he's projecting his own fragmentation on the Streber. So there again, at the level of the discourse, you have truth. But the subjective position behind the discourse is false. So it's interesting that you have history, the, the production of history by accident, where these historical forces in the form of these viewpoints continue to advance the discourse, even though the basis in each case, again and again, is totally inauthentic. Yeah, I think that says it all. The name of this song is Little Johnny. Golden hands. This one's for John. Little Johnny, golden hands. He went out of garbage can. Did he get out? While you were breathing cobbler's glue You came to me into my dreams You took me in or so sacred flame Johnny do you practice what you preach or is your truth out of reach you were only 
doing what you knew to be true. So who the hell could question you? Johnny, is this really what you want to be? Are you praying to be set free? Why don't we make a clean breast of it? Bear your soul now to this novice. Why don't we make a clean breast of it?
Yes. Oh, oh, oh yeah.